the Joe Rogan experience. Is this the uh, thing that you brought? So I thought if I'm the first Welsh person, I've got to keep bring... this. Try to keep this like a fist from your sure. face. There we go. I got to bring a Welsh dragon for you. A Welsh dragon. A Welsh dragon. So this is on our flag in in Wales. Oh. Goes back uh, a, a long time ago since we were like protecting ourselves and pride. Wow, it's cool. Don't really okay. know the history, but there we go. So this is a classic Welsh dragon. Welsh dragon, yeah. Oh, I think it was named like one of the coolest flags in the world. You just got this big, big raging dragon on a flag. That is pretty cool. So I thought if I'm the first Welsh player, I gotta, I gotta bring you a uh, the red dragon. <laughs> Look at it right there. There's some some images there of it. There we go. Yeah. Have you been to Wales before? No. 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 How badass is it? Should it's, I go? Yeah, beautiful. It is a good place. Lots of mountains right on the coast there as well, of course. Forests, lakes, good for training. That's where I do all my training, yeah. actually. Yeah, hardcore elements. Speaking of training, Ash, tell everybody what you've done. So I've recently, only five months ago, now five and a half months, came back from achieving uh, my third world first record in walking the entire length of the Yangtze River in China. So it's the third longest river in the world, uh, the longest to run through a single nation. So it's 4,000 miles. It took 352 days. Um, and it's from the Tibetan Plateau in the west of China. Uh, so you're talking 5,100 meters above sea level, which is equivalent to Everest Base Camp. And, and yeah, 4,000 miles later, 352 days, you end up near, the, near Shanghai, where it pours out into the East China Sea. You know what I thought when I heard that you did this? I thought two things. One, I thought, this guy's insane. <laughs> like, where, what kind of willpower does it take to walk and hike 4,000 plus miles? But the other thing I thought is this kind of validates a lot of the ideas that people have always had about human beings migrating from Africa and through Siberia and yeah. through the Bering Strait. Like, yeah. if you can do that, what you did, what you did is not dissimilar, you know. That's it. It's, yeah. you got trails all over the world. And you're you? just doing it for a, a world record. Imagine if you're doing it because you're trying to stay alive. Exactly. You're trying to keep your family alive. Yeah, yeah. I tell you what, yeah, we would have had... Oh, there's so much, so much history in journeys that mankind kind of taken yeah. on since. Wow, I'm reading um, *Sapien* at the minute. Oh, it's great. I only just started, yeah. but that's just mind-boggling with the numbers. You know, it mm -hmm. takes it right back, and it's like, whoa, whoa. But yeah. Um, yeah, so the source of the Yangtze, it was actually only discovered in 2009. The true and scientific source. Really? So, yeah, that gives us. We had to do two. It took over two years of planning. So it was a case of working heavily in China. Um, finding out whether this had ever been done before. It took, we had to get different teams involved uh, globally. Um, and then we discovered that I was, always, I was always preparing to go from the traditional source, which is most famous for, for the source of the Yangtze, be, uh, Yangtze River being there. But then we only discovered about a year into the planning that actually there's a true and scientific source found by the same guy who mapped the traditional source, yet he partnered up with NASA, used all the satellite technology, was able to correct us wrong, it's slightly longer than, tr than the, the uh, traditional source. And that was it. We're like, right, it's got to be the true and scientific source. How much longer is it? It's probably only a distance of 20 to 30 miles, which that's only really a day's trek, but it was more close to Tibet. It was more south. Uh, southwest of China, so it was closer to the Tibetan border, which means it's a little bit more sensitive. So it, it was tougher to go from from the true and scientific source for sure, but it's the longer one. If you're going to walk that distance, you've got to do it the proper way. Yeah, I agree with you. you I'm know? glad you think that way. Mm. But obviously a person that's willing to walk 4,000 miles would think that way. Like, yeah. You wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't yeah. skip on 20 day. miles. Right. Can you imagine if you skipped on 20 miles and everybody's like, well, you did a pretty good job, yeah. but actually yeah, yeah. Mike over here just did the whole thing. Exactly. The actual yeah. scientific that's one. It. He's the real one. Well, that's hap that happened towards the end as well. So coming up near Shanghai, there's an official uh, point of where the Yangtze pours into the East China Sea. And they're like, you know, you only have to go to this this point. I'm like, no, I'm walking to where the land ends. So mm. that took me an extra, only an extra couple of days. But can you imagine finishing? It's like, oh, you didn't quite make it, did you? You were oh. close, but you didn't quite make it. So what is I'm the walking. feeling like when you know you only have two days left? Oh, man. Well, we were hit by storm... Storm Nakima, so it was one of the biggest storms they've had in the past 30 years. Uh, and that put me into hiding, you know, I had to shelter up after everything that I faced over 350 mm. days, you know. Um, and that stopped me only a couple of days before I crossed into the East China Sea, before the finish. But at that point, it's almost I had visualized the completion over and over again in my head. I'd played it so many times of what it would be like, what it would feel like, what it's, you know, everything to 
to cross the finish line. That almost when that day happened and I did cross the finish line, I almost over visualized. I didn't hmm. feel anything. It's just like, well, so it's about damn time, you know? Wow. Yeah. And I believe, you know, the law of attraction, visualization, I've always been a big believer in that. And same with Mongolia and Madagascar, which my, were my previous expeditions. Uh, I almost lost my life on both of those trips. At the time that I'm suffering, I'm just constantly visualizing. You know, I was focusing on recovering, getting better, visualizing the finish, keep getting up, keep pushing on. I want to get to that. Mm. I want. I want to get to those. But I want to. I want to ask you when you decide to plan this trip. Yeah. So, how much had you learned from the first two crazy trips that you had, and how did you calculate like how much food you're going to need, where you're going to meet, need pit stops, where mm. you're going to be able to, like, how did you do it? So with that, we're always looking for communities along on a long route. You know, if there's a community, there's food. And so, and actually that brings me back to the traditional and then the true scientific source. If we went from the traditional, we'd go maybe one week or one and a half weeks without coming across any locals. So we'd have to carry a week and a half worth of ration packs in our backpack. Mm. But the true and scientific source sent us back. I think it was two or three weeks we couldn't find um, any community along the way via satellite and via the people that we were, they are my logistics managers. So that, that meant we'd need to carry. the craziest way to try to visit people. Yeah. Find them through satellite as you're trekking through a forest. Yeah. And then try to get food. That's it. And we're always maximizing it as well. So we're saying, okay, that's three weeks. So let's carry food for three and a half or four weeks. Because yeah. if that community is now empty or abandoned, then we're out of food. What What are you carrying for food? I would carry uh, ration packs. So, and the ration packs were pretty good. We had like chicken tikka masala, spaghetti bolognese, um, carbonara, and each ration pack was around 800 kilocalories. And are you using like, hot, are these dehydrated? Yeah, that's okay. it. So you just boil the water, and boil you pour the it in water, there. You wait about 15 minutes. It's like a it's mountain house, like that kind of a deal? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, similar. That's it. So, wow, um, you must be. So looking forward to regular food by the time that's Big over. Time. Yeah. Oh, what's the yeah. first thing you ate? Um, you know, the, the one that I was protein, uh, the one that I was craving was just protein. So I was thinking of peanut butter, I was mm. thinking of cheese on toast. Because you had just mostly carbohydrates. Yeah, for your exactly. Hydrate. So I was like yeah. chicken as well was a mm. big thing. I was just craving all of this big time. That's but funny. I don't know what the first thing I ate It's I funny was. how your body knows what you need. Exactly. Yeah, you've got to listen to your body. Yeah. You? You've got to listen. It's like, hard to listen. I mean, it's hard to know. Well, I don't, I'm not really sure what I hear. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you get uh, an odd craving. Sometimes I'm craving ice cream. Is that supposed to, I'm supposed to listen? Mm. Just have ice cream? Like That's that, it. Yeah, exactly. It seems yeah. weird. Yeah, yeah, It seems yeah. weird just listening to your cravings. That seems yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> I, yeah, and I think, yeah, no, you're right. It does. I think almost listening to, you've got to be stripped of all the all of the protein and, and whatnot running through you, your body currently, haven't you? I think if you're full, mm-hmm. You're craving ice cream, you know, if you feel you want a dessert. But I think if you're now at the point of not starvation, but if you're really hungry and you know what's good, what's not good, you, I think your body gives a good tail sign of what you can. Like the last month of Mission Yangtze, I was really bad. I was coming across cities every day because you can imagine like towards Shanghai, you're coming across cities, coming across towns, communities. And so I was just craving protein, I was craving fats. And a lot of the time for that last month, I was just eating really unhealthily. Mm. Just getting in stodgy foods, dodgy fats, protein. You know, there was fast food chains along the way, KFC, you know, that sort of really? month of it. Yes, I was out of the wild. The wilderness was like six months worth. Once I'd finished the first half, it was gradual for then another two or three months. But the last three months, you're going through city after city, all really built up high population there. Um, and I found that my body was crazy. So I was listening to my body, was craving mm. fats, craving protein. And yeah, you're right, it did get ridiculous. I was going to these, you know, fast food. And I, I, the translation, I could speak Chinese a little bit. I, I was could, just going to ask I you I could that. get by. But now, when some, you say Chinese, like which dialect? Oh, there's over a hundred dialects, yeah. So that's where it got difficult. Oh, no. Uh, so even, <laughs> yeah, oh, my, it was nails. It was nails, really difficult. So do you speak of, Mandarin? What do you speak? Your basic Mandarin. Basic is, Mandarin. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Enough to just about get by, but I, I skipped all of the basics and went straight into the sentences, where are, where, are there bears here? Are there bears where here? Where are the wolves? Uh, do where are the wolves? Water, food, you know, oh, shelter. Oh, my God. So, yeah, I skipped a lot of the basics, went straight Dude, into Dude, those the... are two questions I don't ever want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> are there bears here? And where yeah. are the wolves? Yeah. Not, not are there wolves here? Where are they? Where are they? Fuck, That's man. It, we and can. you're out there walking. Yeah. For a year. Yeah. 
that's it. And for the first six oh. months, especially. So the, the first six months is mostly hiking in the woods. It's hiking, yeah, in the wilderness on the Tibetan plateau. Are of, you carrying your camp on your back? Yeah. So you have a bivy sack? Like, what are you sleeping That's in? That's a tent. So we had a this tent. really lightweight sort of Kailas tent. Mm. Just get it up stormproof. So. It's amazing how light they can get those damn oh, things to now. Great. It was it's great. Incredible. We needed it. Yeah. Because I had to carry all of the, the f- we were filming for a documentary, so I had to carry electronics and got too heavy. Now, do you, when you're, when you're in this tent, mm. do you go with a double layer tent so you have provides more insulation and it's a little heavier? Or do you have like a really lightweight tent and just try to tough it out in the cold? We have, uh, I had a double layer, but that's because the double layer was just so small and so light. Yeah. And it was a case of, yeah, you know, that's your comfort, that's your shelter. Right, right, And right. I'm going to be facing some big storms. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was yeah. like, you'd sacrifice probably the weight for just something that's going to keep you insulated in there. That's it. Yeah, do you, for sure. Now, do you have a pad that protects you from the ground? Yeah. And so then I had a, a little mattress steep. pad on top of that? Uh, yeah, we've got the pad, like the waterproof pad on mm-hmm. the ground from the tent. Right. And then we've got a sleeping mat. Uh, maybe about this, this thick, about right. a, a half an inch to an inch thickness. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I had a minus 25 or minus 30 degree Celsius sleeping bag. I don't know what that is in, in Fahrenheit. Uh, but that was, a, you know, you got toasty inside. That. It could what be minus the, 20. What is the issue with the ground, though? Like, do you have to have an insulated pad to yeah. make sure that the ground cold doesn't get to you? Yeah, for sure. That's what the, the sleeping mud is. So it's sort of, you can roll it down. It's really small, really mm-hmm. tight, really lightweight as well. But once you roll it out, um, it's got like memory foam almost inside, something similar. Mm-hmm. And you have to, to, to blow in it, pump it up a little bit more. Oh, I see. Only takes 10, 20 breaths. Um, easy to pack away as well. Really and it protects convenient. you from the cold of the ground. And it protects from there, because that's what you need, you know. Yeah. Like, oh, the, the ground just... Dude, I've never been comfortable camping. It's always just like... Argh. It's yeah, always like you wake yeah. up like popping. Fuck. Yeah, You're that's awake. It. You made it. But still, you feel weird. Yeah, you can do. You do get used to it. Yeah. But um, and especially after the trekking, we were covering 50 kilometers some days. Well, we were covering about 20, 25 miles, especially in the Tibetan Plateau. So after that day's trek, only two ration packs per day. Oof. So you're taking in 1,600 calories. That's not a lot. It's not a lot. We were, and we were carrying How 30. much weight did you lose? I probably, buy, and I've still lost weight now, uh, about 13, 12 to 13 kilograms, oh, okay. I would say, in weight. Uh, which over the year was, I lost the same amount in Mongolia. Is that like 32 pounds, something? It's about 32, is it? 32 pounds, yeah. So, um... Wow, that's a lot of weight to lose. You're not a, a big guy. Yeah, that's it. That's Fuck, it. man. That must have been, you must have been really drawn out at the end. Big time. Ugh. Although it kind of worked itself out because towards the end, I was coming across more food. Didn't need my, my ration packs, of course. So mm. I was coming across more um, restaurants. I can collect food as I, as I go. It's not a solo and unsupported journey. Um, so I was just utilizing that. I was eating with the locals and I was, you know, taking as much calories down as I possibly could whilst I was trekking. Did you pick like the ki- the type of meals based on calories? Did you like when, when I'm talking about like the mountain house type deals or I don't know what company you used, what kind of, Oh, uh, what? Yeah. Expedition foods. I think it, so they it have was that I used. different ones that are more nutrient rich and more calorie rich. Yeah. They have the smaller light ones as well, which you get about 600 calories. Um, they are smaller. They are lighter, easier to pack, but I needed as much as I could possibly get, you know, especially. Yeah, they have a bunch of healthy options now because a Mm. lot of CrossFitters are out there camping these days. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah, that's it. (laughs) (laughs) They want to get that healthy paleo food while they're out there in the mountain. But what's undeniable has got to be for you is that once you've made those steps, Mm. the first steps for the first day, you have this monumental thing in front of you. Yeah. Like, what, what was that like knowing when you started, like, here, ready, all right, bye, Ash, bye. Um, it was, See you it in the air. Oh, man. Da- <laughs> yeah, it was exactly that. It was exactly that. It was daunting. Mm. It was, uh, so before we got to the, before we got to the source of the Yangtze River, we lost, I think, four members. When I say lost, they survived, but they got altitude sickness. Um, they were fearing for their lives because of the bears, because of the wolves. So before we reached day number one, before we reached the start line, we've already got four members of the film crew, of guides, uh, evacuated, taken off the mountains, which brought me off the mountains as well because I needed to regroup with a different team. So everyone was scared and people also got altitude sickness. That's got it. Fucked up. How high are you up there? We are just over 5,000 meters 
Oh my at god! At this point, yeah. So it's equivalent to Everest Base Camp, I'd say. Oh my which god! Which you can get altitude sickness from. One yeah, of the that's guy really it. fucking high. That's fifteen thousand feet, right? That is about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's, uh, and there's it's, wolves up there. There's wolves. Uh, yeah. There's, there's bears. You can't yeah. even run. That's you got it. no air. <laughs> yeah. What? How helpless would you feel at fifteen thousand feet when you see a pack of wolves? You're like, <sighs> oh man. Yeah. And they're looking at you like, exactly. hey, you don't look too good, buddy. Yeah. It's the bears that scared me the most. Oh, they should scare you the you most. You can't do anything against a bear, can you? You can't do anything against a wolf. Yeah, you can't do anything against a wolf. Especially either. at 15,000 feet when exactly. you can barely tie your shoes. And a, and a pack of them as well. <sighs> oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And we can't carry any weaponry. It's illegal no? there. So oh, great. Yeah. Oh, sitting duck. Really? You <laughs> can't carry any really? weaponry? Yeah, yeah. You can't even have a knife? Uh, I tried. I took a knife out. Um... Did I say, yeah, I took a knife out, but I was, it was taken from me in security, oh. flying out to the west. So I bought another one in Yushu. Yeah, I did have a knife for the first month or two. Yeah. But again, a pack of wolves. Yeah, you ain't going to do shit with you a know? little baby ass knife. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're yeah. going to rip your ankles That's apart. That's it. That's it. They tear your legs apart. Yeah. Wolves are the, the nastiest hunters. Big time. Um, and we had close encounter. As well with a, with a pack, there really? was a yeah, there was a, uh, a Tibetan. He was trying to warn us. He was trying to say, "Well, this is my, this is my angle." We were just talking to him. He looked a little bit worried. He looked a little bit stressed. We're high on the mountains. He keeps pointing down at a valley, talking to his into Tibetan. We didn't understand. We just sort of waved, "Oh, thank you, bye, big smile, off we go." I say we. It was me and my friend, also videographer Kyle. We cracked on, but Kyle filmed all of that conversation. And four months later, we find out that from a girl from my editor team in uh, Beijing who could speak Tibetan, that he was saying right ahead, right down that valley is a pack of wolves and only yesterday they had killed a, a local lady and trying to, you know, they were trying to get us not to, to go down there, saying don't go. Whoa. But we didn't know, so we were like, oh yeah, all the best, thanks, see ya. And we cracked on and for the next two days we were followed. We believe we were followed by or stalked by a pack of wolves. We could hear oh howling. my God. And they, they cover bigger distance then than humans cover, you know, and for two days, they were just out in the same proximity, same distance away. Fuck it, fuck, side of the fuck, hill. fuck. How do you go yeah. to sleep at night? What's that like? Yeah, it was, luckily it was windy. The wind would pick up at nighttime, so it would rattle your tent so you couldn't hear the howling. You could only hear oh it during the day. God. But yeah, you still stood there, your knife's there, your torches there, you're constantly shouting over to your buddy. Well, you know, are you okay? worried and that you're just going to become a burrito in the middle of the night? Yeah. A tent burrito? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was scary. I felt vulnerable. Really oh, vulnerable up there. Fuck, bro. And the local. How many days of, were you doing this with the wolves? So, uh, so it was two days that they were following us, but we were in sort of Wolf County, if you like, for the best part of two or three months, I would say. Oh. With the bears as well, and the bears became an issue because I sort of went out there with a healthy mindset. As long as I leave the bears alone, the bears are going to leave me alone, right? But the locals were telling me otherwise, and they would start showing me photos, start showing me videos. Uh, and sending me clips saying this happened only one, two kilometers away from you are, from where you are now. Where people were killed by bears. People were killed, just running into um, huts, killing families. And oh, they were trying geez. to say that they're coming off the mountains because it's too cold. They're looking for calories before they go into hibernation. So we were there in the wrong season. Um, and it's that that terrified us the most. It was the oh. stories of the locals. And, you know, if the locals panic, then you should definitely be panicking as well. Well, there's say. a lot of parts of the world where you have to be really worried about wild animals all the time. Yeah, We here in America, mm. for whatever reason, we've forgotten that. I think everybody that lives in a big city has basically kind of forgotten that. Yeah, yeah. But when you make that trek, you realize like, oh, there's no rules out here. They're, they'll eat you. That's it. They'll eat everything. They'll eat a yeah. caribou. They'll eat a moose. Why wouldn't they, they eat care. you? Yeah. What, do they think you're special? They don't even know yeah. what the fuck you are. Yeah, uh, that's it. It's probably the only thing that keeps you alive is they haven't eaten a person lately. Yeah. And they take, like you said, caribou. They can take the bears are big enough to just to, and caribou, like moose. Yeah. Moose are huge as well. They My friend moose, watched a moose kill, yeah. uh, or excuse me, watched a bear kill a moose on a spotting scope. He was looking through a spotting scope and he saw a bear swat down Whoa. the back of a moose, and just break its back. Snap its back. Terrifying. He said the, the grizzly hit the moose so hard it snapped its back. Jeez. And I'm like, what? The power, the sheer strength a moose. in a bear. And they are big on the, the, the moose. Are moose are huge. huge. Yeah. This bear swatted that thing and broke its back. And he said yeah. he, he watched it go down. He watched this chase. There's like this altercation between this bear and the moose. And he stayed yeah. on it. And the bear gets a hold of the moose and just fucking wow. swats it. Terrifying. The moose is like, I got to get the fuck out of here. And the yeah. bear's like, bitch, you're going nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, those animals are up there in China too. Yeah, they're a very similar type of bear, right? It's a type of brown bear, That's isn't it? it? Type of brown bear, yeah. Slightly. You've got the big ones here, haven't you? The, the proper grizzlies in Alaska. Not they're here. The biggest, aren't they? Well, they killed them all in California. Everything that they had yeah. that was here in California, it's on our fl our flag. It's our state flag. Mm. If you look at the California state flag, there's right. a giant grizzly bear in the middle of the California state flag. No way. Yeah, because it used to be an issue here. Got yeah. They killed so many people that we just killed all the bears. Not we. I wasn't here. Got you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. So yeah, they're further a, north now, are they? That's it right there. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. They're nowhere near here. You got to go up into like Vancouver. British Columbia has Towards them. Towards the British Rockies. Columbia has a lot of bears. Oh, yeah. yeah. They have uh, Montana has them. Montana has grizzlies. Wyoming mm. has grizzlies. Colorado may or may not. My friend Adam saw them there. Yeah. But uh, they're not in California anymore. And it's just because they killed them. There's Jeez. actually a town named after the last guy who died. Oh, really? Le yeah. Levesque, California. The last guy who got killed by a grizzly bear. Just out, out hunting, was it? Or? Just probably being a dude that was alive back Jeez. then. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Terrifying. So you experience this in China. You're, you're, yeah. What are, what are your precautions? Are you allowed to bring bear spray? So we had an air horn. We had a whistle. Oh, that's, Jesus. A whistle. A whistle, yeah. So they say that the, mo the biggest attacks <sighs> happen from where Tibetans out farming, doing their business in the mountains. They... They, they're in the forest and they surprise. They come up the top of the hill. There's a right. bear there, and obviously the bear's shocked. It's scared and it just attacks. Yeah, that does happen with bears in America. That's as well. it. Yeah, so they would say pretty much take a whistle, take an air horn, make yourself aware. Well, make the bear aware that you're that you're present, you're yeah. approaching. And normally they would be they would you know scare off, they'd run away. But there was a local that told me that. So they have these big Tibetan mastiffs. Have you seen the Tibetan mastiffs? Like the, yes. the dogs that guard the, the two hundred plus stock. pounds are huge, terrifying. More of a problem than the the wolves they were for me, because um, they can scare away the wolves, they scare away snow leopards, the bears. But this one local was telling me that it, he wasn't living in his gur, which is like a white felt tent, like a, a yurt. He was living in a concrete hut. And he had a courtyard with a fence. The fence was open, but just outside the fence, a Tibetan Mastiff chained up. And he said that this bear wasn't phased about the Tibetan Mastiff. It walked straight past it into the courtyard and was scratching at his steel door whilst he was hiding in one of his empty cupboards. And it lasted about 30, 40 minutes. And he was telling me this story. Oh. And I'm like, I'm in a tent. Oh I, my it's scratching God. against a steel door and I'm just in a tent in the wilderness. Fuck, man. They're monsters. If yeah. they weren't a real thing... If grizzly bears or brown bears weren't real, mm. and then they were in a movie, you'd be like, "What? Yeah, imagine yeah, that would. poor guy!" And imagine you, you'd like you. Someone would ask someone like you, like, "Why in the world? Yeah. If you know they're there, would you gonna want to walk mm. for that long yeah. in bear country?" Yeah. Well, that's that's it. That's part how many of, people are with you? Um, towards the start, so it was myself. It was two guides that I had, Tibetan guides, so we couldn't even communicate. Oh. Um, but with safety in numbers. And we took a horse for the film crew, but the film crew got altitude sickness and left us with the horse, which I, I named Caster Choi. Have you ever seen the movie Face Off? Yes. The, the badass Caster Choi. Oh, I've that's got, hilarious. I've got this thing where I name like my bicycles or like carried a chicken. We'll get to that. Carried a chicken in Madagascar. And I've been giving them old, crazy, ridiculous granny names. And I was like, this horse is the last one standing. Whilst my my crew, my my guides are suffering with altitude sickness and, and being taken off the mountains. You've got this horse still suffering with altitude sickness. Never knew that, but apparently horses can, animals can suffer with altitude sickness. But he's there like a badass, still going. So it's just me and him, and I'm like. I can't give you a, a granny's name like Elder or Dot or Gertrude. <laughs> I'm giving you Caster Joy. <laughs>